Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Lisa Sin. Um, I want to welcome all of you to the Oxford Business and Human Rights Research Network, which is a practitioner and academic forum within the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights. If this is your first time at an OxBHR event, a very special welcome to you. Today, we're really lucky to have uh, Vidya and uh, Oliver um, from Moonshot Counter Violent Extremism here with us uh, to talk about the business of human rights and technology. Uh, Vidya is the uh, founder of this organization and Oliver is an analyst uh, working hard on the front line. Um, the focus here is uh, not just human rights, but uh, vulnerable individuals, and they'll go into more detail about it um, over the course of the seminar. So I should actually be welcoming both of you back as alumni of Oxford University, where you completed the Migration Studies program. Um, so it's lovely to have you back, even if it is virtually. Uh, some housekeeping before we get going. The format of today is that we will have Vidya and Oliver speak to us for about 30 minutes, and then the rest of the hour will be dedicated to uh, Q&A, so another 30 minutes for that, with a view to finishing at the latest by 1.45 p.m. here in the UK. Uh, please do feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the session so we can seamlessly transition from uh, the first half of the event uh, to the second bit. And so that is all the housekeeping from me. Um, so if you guys are ready, um, I, I think I will hand over to you now, Vidya and Oliver. Thank you so much. And I believe we are sharing some slides. So Isabel, um, in, the, in the behind the scenes, if you could flick that up for us, that's wonderful. Thank you all, enjoy. Great, thank you so much for the introduction, Lisa. And it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm gonna kick us off and I will hand over to Oliver. Um, I'm Vidya, I'm co-founder of Moonshot. And I'm gonna start by giving you some background on, on Moonshot more generally, who we are and the kinds of work that we do. Um, so we are an organization that works with NGOs, with governments and with tech companies to respond to online harms. Now, our, our core work really started with response to violent extremism and terrorism online across ideologies. And over the years, and more recently in the last year in particular, we've expanded our remit to cover a range of different online harms, including gender-based violence, trafficking, disinformation online, and others. So most of the examples that Oliver and I are going to give today are mostly focused on our extremism work, but we will share some examples and some anecdotes from some of our work on other forms of online harm. Um, my background in particular really started with the fight against white supremacist and far-right extremism. That was my personal area of passion, um, an issue of passion in setting up Moonshot. But I, I wanna start first just with some context around the online space and violent extremism online. As I'm sure all of you will be aware, today individuals are posting, accessing, and engaging with, with harmful and violent extremist content online at a really alarming rate. And the tech companies are improving their efforts to moderate and remove terrorist content, but it's certainly not enough to stem violent extremism online on its own. And this is really for three reasons, and I'm gonna quickly run through those three reasons. The first is that the vast majority of violent extremist content may not even be eligible for takedowns according to the terms of service and the policies of many of the tech companies, whether they're large or small. And these groups often walk the line and they do that incredibly well. The second reason is when content is removed, the, the post, the video, or the account might be deleted, but the individual who posted it, the human being that posted it, that person still exists. We didn't delete that person from the world and they may continue to repost online, to move to another platform, or may be deeply vulnerable and pose a threat to the community around them. And the third reason is that there's still many spaces on the internet which are just not liable to takedowns at all and where this content can thrive. If we move on to the next slide, um, if you can just click, there we go. This was a search that was entered into Google by an individual in the UK after the Christchurch terrorist attack in March 2019 in New Zealand, an attack with, which left 51 people dead. Now, Brenton Tarrant, as some of you may know, is the name of the perpetrator. So obviously someone entering into Google information which um, turns that perpetrator into a hero. This same search was replicated across the globe in the days that followed that attack in New Zealand, in Norway, across dozens of countries, across numerous languages, 
and across search engines. Now, moments like this, when someone enters something like this into Google, this is not liable for takedown. A Google search cannot be removed or blocked. You can enter whatever you'd like into Google search. And more often than not, when you search for violent content on Google, it presents in the top search results. So while content moderation and content removal is important, it can't be the solution to violence and extremism online alone. So when we set up Moonshot, we really set up with the intention to develop and, and to use technology, which would both help us understand the spread of violent extremism, but would, which would also allow us to use the internet to actually reach people and to intervene. And I should say here, before I, I give you more details about how we do that, I should say here, I'm not a technologist by background or training. Um, most of my career has been dedicated to the delivery of social work methods to pull people out of hate groups, out of, um, out of violent groups. And so my work has always been based on the fundamental belief that change is possible, even for those that we might think are, are too far gone. And from my perspective, the internet presents a great opportunity for us to interact with people and try and plant the seeds for that change. And that's really what Moonshot aims to do. So Moonshot today is a team of nearly 50 people um, based mostly in our offices in London, but working around the world. And it's a weird and wonderful mix of skills that we've brought together. We have former software engineers and data scientists. We have a former detective on staff, a former mental health nurse practitioner on staff. Um, we have communications and marketing experts. We have human rights activists. It's a, a weird and wonderful mix of skills. And how does that group actually work together to find audiences at risk of violent extremism online? If we move on to the next slide, I'll walk you through this. So individuals at risk of violent extremism often leave behind what I like to call a trail of clues in the online space. These are often publicly available clues. It's essentially a digital footprint that's letting us know the path they're taking. So what we've done at Moonshot is we've developed databases of hundreds of thousands of online indicators of risk. So this includes the keywords and phrases that are used by these movements, the slogans and racial slurs, the propaganda they share, the music they listen to, um, content which glorifies their heroes. And we built databases that then plug into tools that can help us wade through publicly available data to find those that are leaving us a digital footprint in the public domain, telling us that they are at risk of getting involved in some form of violence. Now, once we find those audiences, once we've found those audiences online, what do we actually do to, to interact with them? If we move on to the next slide, I'll walk you through several tiers of programming, which can be delivered to achieve these four objectives. So building situational awareness of the risk of violent extremism online, safeguarding the online space, intervening in the cases of high risk internet users, and then last but not least, reducing harm and impact on wider communities. So we're going to walk you through, both Oliver and I are going to walk you through these four, and we're going to give you some examples along the way of how we, how we achieve these objectives. So if we move to the next slide, we'll start with building situational awareness. What we mean by this is basically building an evidence base around the scale of violent extremism online. And this is really the first step before we can deliver programming to respond. We want any programming to respond online to be evidence-based so that we're not driving our responses based on any assumptions about how these groups operate. If we move to the next slide, I just wanna share with you a few examples of how we do this, how we build up that evidence base. Now, I mentioned earlier that Google search is essentially an unmoderated space. Google doesn't ban any searches. Well, this is one of the reasons why we find search data, search traffic data particularly useful in understanding the scale of the problem of violence online. And another reason why it's useful is it's non-performative. So it's not like Facebook or Twitter uh, or other social media platforms where users are really choosing to make a statement to their networks in a post. I think with Google search or any search engine, many of us tell our, our deepest, darkest, darkest secrets to Google. And so it's in many ways actually a particularly useful source to monitor forms of violence or forms of extremism, which might be embarrassing for someone to say in the online world, or might, they might be, feel like they'll be stigmatized if they say in, in an offline setting, but they might turn to Google to access this content. So what you're seeing here is a county by county breakdown of attempts to access far right extremist content, specifically white supremacist content across the United States last year. You can see some example search terms included in the top right hand corner. 
And last year, we tracked nearly 1 million attempts to access content affiliated with far-right extremism across the United States. That's in 2019 alone in one year. And at the start of the pandemic this year, we tracked a 37% increase in attempts to access this kind of content on search across the US. And in countries where we've been building longitudinal data sets, it's also possible for us to assess spikes and escalations in behaviors online as a result of any incident or event. And in nearly every geogra geographical context where we're able to do this, we tend to see engagement or searches for extremist content spike in the aftermath of violent events. If we move to the next slide, I just want to show you one example here. Following the attack in the United States, it was on August 3rd, 2019, on a Walmart in El Paso, Texas. Um, it was an attack by a white nationalist who had been inspired by the Christchurch attack. Following that attack, we were able to map a 54% increase in attempts to access white supremacist content online nationwide across the United States in the week immediately following that attack. And as you can see in the bottom left of that slide, a 495% increase in attempts to access content that's violent, violent towards Jewish communities, um, and an 82 and 83% increase in uh, searches for content violence towards Black and Mexican communities. Now, this is a similar trend that we, we see after every attack, specifically in the United States, but internationally. Following um, the 2018 attack on a synagogue, a synagogue in Pittsburgh in the US, we were able to identify a 92% increase in searches for this content. And if we go back in time even more after the 2017 Charlottesville incident in the US, we tracked a 400% increase in searches for this content. Now, what's really worrying, worrying for us is we don't often return back to normal engagement levels post-incident. In some cases, the baseline resets slightly higher year on year following every attack, which is obviously a very worrying trend. Now, before I chat to you about how we use data like this to reach people who are at risk of getting involved in violence, I want to really quickly show you an example of how we're using these methods to build an evidence base to deal with other forms of violence and so not just violent extremism. And not just to evidence the scale or the volume of potential perpetrators, but also to evidence the need for support for victims and survivors of violence. Now, we've been doing work on gender-based violence for the past three years, really. We, we did a, a long-term project with the UN Women to evidence gender-based violence online across Asia and the Pacific. And more recently, during lockdown in the, in the UK um, and during coronavirus this year, we started to do more of this work locally here in the UK. So if we move to the next slide. So following reports earlier this year by domestic violence charities about increased rates of domestic violence, we wanted to see if we could help those charities build the evidence base on specifically on the need for support for people who might be experiencing domestic violence. So the data visualized here was gathered during a 22 day period after the closure of many public spaces in the UK earlier this year in March, April. And we've continued this work. We're, not, we're sharing this data as widely as possible with domestic violence NGOs to get them the evidence they need to tailor their work and reach people with their services. As I said, most of the examples we'll be discussing today are related to violent extremism, but we do deliver work on a range of, of forms of violence online. And I wanted to just give you an example of how these methods apply. Um, you can find this data and the, the wider data set here uh, available on our website if, everyone, if anyone wants to look into it a bit more. Um, if we move to the next slide. Um, so how can we use online data to reach people at risk of violence? Um, I'm going to talk first about safeguarding the online space. So what we do is we run global prevention and safeguarding campaigns to reach users that are at risk of violent extremism in a number of countries and to offer them safer alternatives. Now, one example here, we partnered with Google several years ago to repurpose advertising technology to try and reach violent extremists with content which really discredits these ideologies or offers alternatives. How does this work? So what, what we're doing here is we're repurposing tools which were developed for commercial purposes and we're using them for social good. So for example, when someone sees, um, when someone searches for right-wing extremist content, and maybe if we go to the next slide, I think there's an example here. When someone searches for um, far-right extremist content, the very first piece of content they will see will be an advertisement offering them safer content. Now, the aim of this is really to ensure that every person searching for hate content is given the choice 
to consume safer content. So not to force them to consume safer content, but just making sure that alternative is there. And to offer them alternatives that will keep them engaged, that will plant seeds of doubt, that will grant them the possibility for, for long-term change. We now deliver this method globally with the, the main objective being to really, as I said, ensure there's always a safer option available to those who are looking to engage with harmful content. Now, increasingly, we not only connect users with safer content, but we also increasingly connect them with local services so they can access and engage with services which might help them turn their lives around. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Oliver who will walk you through some, some more examples of how we engage with these kinds of audiences online. Over to you, Oliver. Yeah, thank you, Vidya. And um, if you could get the next slide up as well. Thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna continue discussing the last two points and objectives of our work. So beginning with this third point here on the screen, intervening in cases of high-risk internet users. So the digital campaigns we run can, in addition to the points raised by Vidya, be used to signpost at-risk users to services. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And as you'll see from the visualization of the screen at the moment, in our work, we identify at-risk audiences and provide services, whether that be videos, manuals, self-help guides, or online chat and hotline services. The important thing to note here is that technology is allowing us to invest more in each interaction, so that we're not just giving someone counter content and hoping they change their minds. We've actively set up programs which aim to facilitate communication between at-risk audiences and trained intervention providers, for example, mental health and social care providers. This engagement can be delivered through the context of a government program. So for example, through police outreach or by community organizations with suitable skills and qualifications to manage interaction with vulnerable individuals. We developed online intervention and referral mechanisms with, amongst others, the governments of the UK, Australia and Canada, allowing us to reach at-risk communities online with real world support at a scale never before seen. And this support isn't offered without good reason. And indeed we consistently find that violent extremists are disproportionately likely to engage with self-help content and offers of assistance online. Um, the next slide please. Thank you. And so to put some figures on this, in tests conducted last year we found that white nationalists were 48% more likely to engage with mental health ads than the general public. And if they were looking to join a violent group they were 115% more likely. And this isn't just white nationalists in the far right either because this is matching our global jihadism data set too. In tests also conducted last year, a global jihadist audience was 47% more likely to engage with mental health ads than the comparison group. Why is this, you may ask? Well, for both groups, this may be due to some of the underlying personal and psychological drivers of extremism. So for example, feelings of anxiety. Sorry about that. Um, there might be some problems with my sound, so I'm gonna try um, something a bit closer to my, uh, to my computer. Why is this? You may ask. Well, as I was saying, um, for both groups, this may well be due to some of the underlying personal and psychological drivers of extremism. So, for example, feelings of anxiety and hopelessness, which create a greater likelihood of engagement with these types of resources. There are, of course, many other reasons. And I'm sure another day, Vidya and I could give a hold of the presentation on this point. For now, though, I'll move on to the final objective, um, which relates to reducing harm and the impact on wider communities. Uh, so next slide, please. This, and if, um, if um, you still can't hear me very clearly, please, please butt in and, and say something. I can try and do something about it. This final point, so this final point, reducing harm and impact in wider communities is a little different to all the others too, as it concerns not an extremist audience, but rather the wider public. So unfortunately, in the past few years, we've witnessed several examples of terrorist live streaming attacks. While the most notable example of this was perhaps in relation to the Christchurch attacks of March 2019, We've also seen other forms of highly disturbing content disseminated in relation to recent terror attacks perpetrated all over Europe. Just over a month ago in Paris, for example, the killer of teacher Samuel Paty posted a disturbing image of the, act of the attack to Twitter just moments after it took place. Sadly, I think this concern is going to remain a significant issue in the years to come, raising questions about the public health impact of members of the public engaging with such traumatic and distressing content. So to provide an example, and slide please, Thank you. So to provide an example of some of the work we've been doing, moving back to the Christchurch attacks, in their immediate aftermath, we were running campaigns internationally with the governments of Canada, the US, UK and Australia. And within 24 hours, we ensured harm reduction campaigns were live to ensure that those searching for the video online were met with safe alternatives. Over the longer term, harm reduction campaigns can be delivered to reach the general public who may have or are likely to interact with traumatic and distressing terrorist content to ensure that they are, they are offered access to services. 
These can allow us to both monitor and assess the reach of distressing content, understand some of the demographics and of audiences requiring support and tailor services accordingly. Uh, perfect, next slide please. So I hope that served as an interesting kind of introduction to, to the work Moonshot does and to some of the, the more fundamental motivations and objectives that underpin our work. I'll now move to the second portion of our presentation today, which concerns some of the ethical considerations that underpin our work. So Moonshot has sought to develop an ethical, uh, sorry, an approach with ethical considerations at its centre. Before outlining some of the some of the considerations that underpin our work, I'd just like to caveat this whole section really by saying that ethically speaking, we're certainly not perfect. As will now be apparent from the first portion of this presentation, the work Moonshot does really lies at the nexus of technology and public safety. There are always many competing priorities relating, for example, to, to the balance between individual privacy and public safety. The responsibility to identify and mitigate the multitude of risks associated with the delivery of our products. Thinking through this aspect of our work is very complicated. However, we're committed to really discussing and ultimately interrogating these complications and difficulties. You know, we won't always get it right, but as an organization, we're doing our best and are certainly dedicated to learning from our mistakes. So moving towards our kind of actual and concrete ethical approach now, the most high level, overarching, you might say, principle that motivates our work is, is the desire to do no harm. Now, clearly, this is a really broad principle, but I hope in the rest of this presentation to provide some concrete insight into how this very broad principle materializes in the way we run projects. And I'll do this through identifying four ethical considerations that really permeate our decision making. These four considerations are by no means exhaustive, rather they just provide interesting insights into the way we work, and some of the challenges we face, um, even often on a day-to-day -day basis. Next slide, please. So the first consideration relates to the outset of a project and choosing which products we take forward. Before confirming a project, we interrogate the source of funding that project has. And there are two related issues here. The first of which is a more simple question. So asking where a project's funding comes from, and if you are comfortable pursuing a project that has this particular funding source. The second issue is related, but perhaps a little more nuanced. This relates to us asking a question about the focus of a particular project. For example, if the scope of work raises ethical questions about a client's economic and political interest. So Moonshot is a private sector organization, and obviously we're in the position, the lucky position of being able to choose not to progress a particular project or to enter into a relationship in a particular organization. If we feel that the project or funder does not align with Moonshot's own moral compass. And how well, you may ask, how do we decide on this? Well, and, and this may seem like an obvious answer, but, but through conducting really extensive due diligence and any potential partner. Once we've conducted this process, we really interrogate what we know about the potential client or source of funding and ask if the project is motivated by a particular economic or political interest that Moonshot does not consider itself aligned with. So you'll, you'll appreciate, obviously, for confidentiality reasons that I'm unable to give concrete examples on when this has happened. It certainly has been the case in the past that Moonshot has turned down potential contracts because we deem that Moonshot's principles to be insufficiently aligned with the potential partners. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the second ethical consideration that runs through our work is the need to balance public safety on the one hand and human rights on the other. And I'd say this is probably likely the meatiest consideration that we have to consider, and often even on a daily basis too. Now, obviously, this, this question, this distinction between public safety and human rights is a huge topic with an incredible amount of literature behind it. And I, clearly, I don't intend to solve the problem today, but rather just to provide a few empirical insights about this relationship, about this relationship and how we balance it. I think before going further, though, it's important to highlight a couple of things. The first is that much of the data that we deal with is in the public domain already. For example, content that is posted to public accessible social media profiles. A further point to note here is that when data is not in the public domain, it's often not tied to a particular individual. So in the first portion of this presentation, Vidya and I spoke about our redirect method, a way of identifying at-risk individuals and providing them with positive forms of content. So when we support this work with search traffic analysis, for example, you don't see something as stark as, you know, Mr. Smith with this IP address searched this on that particular day. Rather, we just see that a certain number of people search a certain string of text without having access to the named individuals behind these searches. So we do deal with private data, sure, but often in a way that's not indexed to a particular individual. So going back to the balance between public 
safety and human rights. It's really important to note that our work is not only motivated by a desire to create public safety, despite being primarily a CBE organization working in the field of security. I think one thing that really marks Moonshot out is our desire not just to create public safety, but also to seek to reach out to the potentially vulnerable individuals engaged with extremist content with the aim of offering them a different path. I think when people think about the balance between public safety and, and human rights, it's mostly conceptualized as a relationship of tension. That as we promote public safety, human rights take a hit, or as we seek to protect rights and liberties, the public is inevitably put in greater danger. I think some of the real value of Moonshot's work is that it disrupts this way of understanding the issue. We conduct work that we hope contributes to public safety, while also seeking to identify and provide help to those who choose to engage with a different path. So to provide a bit of a more concrete example, the question over the balance of human rights on the one hand and public safety on the other often comes to the fore when we use pseudonymized accounts or avatars to enter group chats on social media and messaging platforms. We do this in order to reach out to at-risk individuals engaging with extremists or other forms of harmful content. In these cases, we have to ask ourselves what the expectation of privacy is in these chats, and this will vary by both platform and geographical context. So, for example, we currently have a project running in Bangladesh in which we seek to connect um, users engaging with extremist content with social care workers. In this case, the social workers enter group chats using these pseudonymized avatar accounts. I mean, there are a few reasons for this, but principally this is just to protect the social care workers themselves. Just in order to protect their identity, we obviously can expect them to enter such group chats with their personal profiles. This is not to say, though, that in all cases we would interact with these groups in exactly the same way. Every situation, as you can appreciate, has its own complexities and challenges, and a one-size-fits-all approach would, would not be appropriate. Um, I'm moving to the next slide, please. Thank you. So the third ethical consideration I'd like to discuss today relates to protecting individual privacy. Obviously, there are numerous different considerations to note here. And on the broadest level, Moonshot is thoroughly committed to protecting individual privacy. In our work on human trafficking, for example, we ensure that there is a laser focus on the perpetrators and the crime itself, and their data is not connected on the, on the victims. However, there are cases, not about human trafficking, but more broadly, that do pose certain challenges to this approach. These are fairly rare occasions, but we do, in the course of our work, sometimes encounter content that indicates a specific and imminent threat to life. In these cases, it's our duty, our civic duty, really, to report this content to the relevant authorities so that they can take proportionate action against the threat. However, there are also cases where we identify a specific and imminent threat in a country that fails to protect and ensure basic human rights. In these cases, we still have a responsibility to report the threat, but we would not do this directly to the government. Rather, we'll find an alternative route to report the threat to an authority that is able to take proportionate measures to deal with it. In different circumstances, this could be to an NGO or, or to an IO, or even to a specific embassy operating within the country in question. This in, indeed does come back to, the, to some of the points I was making a moment ago on the balance between public safety and human rights. It demonstrates, I think, that in certain cases where the threat is specific and imminent, the correct way to act is to, to report the threat to a relevant authority in the interest of public safety. And next slide, please. Thank you. And so the final ethical consideration I'd like to briefly discuss relates to the impact of our projects. Again, this is obviously a really large and highly complex issue. And to return to, a, to return to a point I made at the outset of my discussion of ethics, the overarching principle that guides our consideration of project impact is that of do no harm. And in the context of project impact specifically, there are a few facets of this approach. So one really relates to conflict sensitivity of ensuring that our projects do not entrench certain harmful viewpoints, so extremist viewpoints, for example, rather than fulfilling their purpose of illuminating an alternative viewpoint. This risk is perhaps most pronounced in communities where the harmful viewpoint is very dominant and where there is a high level of suspicion of the alternative viewpoint. So how do we ensure, you may ask, we are sensitive to these kind of concerns? Well, a lot of them manifest in the type of counter content we choose to provide. In terms of that, our thinking has really evolved since Moonshot was founded five years ago in 2015. And we always try to provide forms of counter content that are appropriate to the specific political and cultural context in which the project is conducted. While connecting at risk individuals with mental health resources might be, might be appropriate in one context, providing links to videos and articles that attempt to deconstruct extremist narratives might be more appropriate in another. 
there are clearly there are no easy answers here. And the point I'm trying to make, trying to emphasize, is that a context specific approach is, is always going to be favorable. Another point I'd like to reference here is, is that we can never fully anticipate product impact. This implies that the most important thing is that we are alert to potential risks and the potential for new considerations and challenges to arise during the delivery of a project. Well, how is this done? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to the processes really and ensuring that we as an organization have processes in place that enable us both to identify potential future risks and also to reflect more broadly about project impact. We certainly do have these processes in place in terms of regular ethics meetings, an ethics committee, and ethical process frameworks that need to be followed by those delivering projects. Obviously, I, I, you know, I will emphasize again that there are, there are a real array of other ethical considerations here, not just relating to this consideration to project impact, but also to a multitude of other issues. However, if you were to take just one thing from this portion of the presentation, I'd emphasize again, Moonshot's commitment to, to the principle of do no harm in all of our work. And I will now pass you back over to Vidya to discuss the final part of our presentation today. Great, thank you, Oliver. Um, I'm just gonna end on a couple of final messages here so that we can go into Q&A. But I wanted to say a few words on why we set up as a business, um, because that, that was a very important decision for us when we set up the organization. Um, Moonshot is not a non-for-profit. We very deliberately set up as a business with a social impact mission. Some of the considerations when we set up as a business were, um, I'm, I'm just gonna walk you through quickly four of these. The first was really an ability to innovate. I, I spent my career working in the charity and nonprofit sector and experiencing firsthand some of the limitations that that model, the nonprofit model has when it comes to innovation. A lot of donors to nonprofits really struggle to put money towards truly risky or new approaches. And in order to, de to develop technology, um, if you wanna be at the forefront of technology development, you really need the freedom to rapidly iterate, to try new things, to fail, and then to try again. And the funding constraints for nonprofits felt impossible for us to be able to manage technological innovation and to, to manage the piloting of, of really what were risky and new methods online. But the second, the second consideration for us was really the ability to invest in our own programming. Um, linked with the point I, I just mentioned, we knew that funders in this space were being frank a few years behind us. Um, in 2015, when we set up Moonshot, you would struggle to find a funder who would be willing to put money towards work on white supremacy. Things have changed now and um, you know, white supremacy is in the news every day these days. But in 2015, you would struggle to find a funder who was willing to put money towards that. It was a time when a lot of money was going towards the fight against ISIS, but whether foundations or governments, they were systematically underestimating the need for resources to respond to white supremacy. So what we did as Moonshot and what we were able to do is we invested in that work ourselves. Our model was, you know what, if we can't find funders to invest in it, we will invest in it ourselves. We will provide that evidence base to the actors that have money to put into this space to prove to them that they need to invest in this work, that it's a problem. And then once we've proven that to them, we then are in a position for, for us to scale it up with partners that now have the evidence they need to de-risk the work. That ability to invest in programming that no one else will fund was, it would be very difficult for a nonprofit. And I'll, I'll say frankly that in the first few years of Moonshot's history, we self-financed all of our work on far-right extremism until we were able to convince some of our partners that it was a problem worth investing in. And that was the point at which we were then able to scale up that work considerably. considerably. The third consideration here is really financial independence. Um, and, and Oliver mentioned some of the points around this, but given the sensitivity of the work we do, we never wanted to be in a position where our survival as an organization was tied to any particular donor. We needed the ability to turn down new projects or to, frankly, to walk away from a partner if they were asking us to do something that didn't match our values. And that's much easier to do when you have a different business model. But I guess the, the fourth and final consideration here was, was really around our own staff. We wanted a model that would allow us to support our staff, to invest in staff training, to invest in staff welfare, and to invest in staff well-being. And it, it was so important to us to be able to do work on um, what can be really um, 
challenging subject matters, it was really important for us to have a business model which would allow us to provide the support we needed to to our staff. We didn't want to be in a position where we were trying to convince donors to fund this and being forced to live without it and deliver programs without it. Now, as a business, we have the freedom to invest in this um, to, to whatever extent we, we would like to, and that was really crucial for us. So those are just a few of the considerations that we took on board when we decided to set up as a business and some of the reasons why we've we found ourselves able to do work that we just wouldn't be able to do as a nonprofit. Now we're a business with a social mission and our mission is incredibly important to everything we do and it drives us. Um, but I wanted to make sure I just touched on why we made that decision and some of the opportunities it gives us. Um, great with that I will hand back over to Lisa. Thank you so much, uh, Vidya and Oliver. Um, and thank you, Isabel, for operating the slides so wonderfully. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for covering so much ground. I think you really sort of gave us really some really fascinating insights, including the business model aspect, um, which I would love to ask you more questions about. But I think I should reserve my questions for now and allow our um, the questions from the audience to come through first. Um, let me stop recording. So just so you know, the recording is